for Utah Broadcast. My name is Katie Matheson. I'm the Communications Director here at Alliance for a Better Utah. And today we have a very special guest, Representative Sandra Hollins. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for having me Yes, here. <laughs> yes. And of course, we have Lauren Simpson, who was our Policy and Advocacy Fellow. Hi. Wait, are we saying Policy and Advocacy now? I, I changed it because advocacy was too long. So officially now, it's just Policy Fellow. You don't want to advocate. That what it Too is? many syllables. <laughs> yep. That makes sense. Okay, policy fellow Lauren Simpson. Um, so a quick reminder in the beginning, every Wednesday at 1230, we're going to go live here on Facebook, and we're speaking with Utah movers and shakers and talking about the issues that are important to Utahns. Um, so you can click Get Reminder whenever you see that we're going to go live, and Facebook will remind you that we are going to be here. Um, so I'm going to give a brief intro, intro to today's topic. It's um, We're talking about Juneteenth, and we're going to talk about uh, the background to this celebration and what it really means. Um, so for those of you at home who aren't sure what Juneteenth is, it's the celebration of the emancipation of the lost enslaved people in the United States. And this happened in 1865, two years, I believe, after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. So, oh yeah. So, um, and the first celebration happened in 1866, which is the year after it went into effect. Mm -hmm. So, um, Representative Hollins, before, again, we get into it, can you give us some of your background, talk about when you were elected? Um, <laughs> sure. Um, so I represent District 23, which is the northwest side of Salt Lake City. So I represent the west side of Salt Lake City. Um, I was elected in 2014, um, was sworn in in 2015. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker. And so a lot of my work and advocacy has been around the homeless population and those who live in poverty. Um, that's, um, that's where my passion is, and that's, that's what I love to do. All right, so before, again, we start, we're going to play a game. Our favorite game, Is This Real Life? And you guys have to guess. I'm going to give you a headline, a news headline, and you have to determine whether or not it's real or fake. Okay. Okay? So, and if you have justifications for your decisions, please let us know, because people at home are dying to hear. And I will try to not giggle and give away the answers. All right, first one. 2,505 women in Ireland break world skinny dipping record. Real or fake? I'm going to say that is real. I'm going to say it's fake because that sounds so cold. It's real. Oh. <laughs> I feel like they're used to the, the cold in Ireland. I feel like they got it covered. Okay, next one. Alabama lawmaker brings criminal charges against a local zoo after he was bitten by a zebra. You know, <laughs> as weird as that sound, I'm going to say it's real. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doubting Thomas. I'm going to say it's fake. It is fake. Really? But now we know what's going to happen if you get bit by a zebra <laughs> at the zoo. And they have a new baby zebra, by the way, at the Hoggle Zoo. Adorable. Go look at their Instagram. Okay. Next one. Stray ostrich terrorizes children at a Build-A-Bear workshop in Houston, Texas. Kyle says no way behind the scenes. <laughs> how, how would an ostrich even get into a Build-A-Bear? Did the zebra let it out? <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, I'm going to say it's fake. I'm going to say it's fake, too. It is fake. Okay. Well done. Everybody <laughs> sighed a big sigh of relief because if that was real, no one would be safe. All right. MIT creates psychopath AI by making it look at a Reddit forum. And having oh, looked at Reddit forums? That's real. <laughs> I'm going to say it's real. It is, in fact, real. Go read the details. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, next one. New reptile found in Argentina that tickles its prey to death. Um, I'm going to say that is fake. We're getting a lot of weird animal ones. I'm... <laughs> I want it to be real, but I think that it's fake. It is fake. Well done. Well done. Okay, last one. Patron shot by FBI agent at Colorado nightclub to receive free drinks forever. Oh, is that the one where the FBI agents, so the FBI agent's gun went off, like, as he was dancing, so. But it I was a backflip, so. Right. 
Well, I hope that's real because that patron. Wait, no. Was anybody shot? Yes. Oh. Shot. Well, he deserves a lifetime of free drink, so I hope that. randomly getting shot <laughs> while you're dancing yeah. but yay for free drinks for life so i'm glad he's okay yes. yes i think it was i think he was shot in the leg he was yeah okay now let's get really down to business so let's talk about juneteenth um where does the name come from that's kind of an odd so it's you can see it in the the title of this um, episode but it's june and then just teenth so the, where does the name come from? Do you know the background of the name? Sure. Um, it's a reflection of when the um, citizens of the slaves in Galveston, Texas, received the news that they had been freed. Um, and so it was June the 19th. And so they cut the date short, cut it, the, it short and just called it Juneteenth, which, re which um, symbolizes June the 19th. Mm -hmm. And so what exactly happened? So the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, and then this happened, what, what year did I say, 1986? Um, no, I'm 18, sorry, 19, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, mm -hmm. um, And so why did it take so long for this to happen? You know, there's a lot of speculation what held the news up. Mm -hmm. um, there's speculation that there was someone going to tell them the news, but he was murdered. Um, there is a speculation that um, the slave owners chose not to give them the news hmm. um, because they wanted to continue to, wanted them to continue working and they still have their crops. Um, there was a, there was speculation that the federal government took that long to get there because um, they wanted to accommodate the, um, the the slave owners. So I have not seen any facts or anything that. Um, collaborate which story is the real story mm -hmm. um, but we um, the slaves um, were out to read and um, and so it would have taken them longer in order to get that and to get that news Wow okay um, and so my understanding is that so it was celebrated the year afterwards like immediately afterwards they started celebrating and then celebrations kind of um, stopped or didn't stop but became less um, common and was this around the same time as the Jim Crow era? Yes, um, during that time, well, when they received the news they went out into the streets and they celebrated. So they celebrated um, that entire day that they got the news so that um, but it didn't become a, an official celebration until the following year when they started commemorating the date. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there was a decline in the Juneteenth celebration. And, and, and again, there's a lot of speculation as to why that happened. Um, it could have been um, for economic reasons. It could have been that um, during that time period, people were less, like to, uh, less likely to allow blacks to have celebrations on their land. Um, which is why they were held mostly at churches, um, you know. Um, and also there was a shift in the way we were l doing things and teaching our kids. Um, uh, there started to be a decline in um, our oral history and, and schools, as kids were going more into schools, they were dependent on kids, but we all know um, teachers in the school system, but we all know that the school system did not teach a lot of black history, well, it didn't teach black history at all. And so um, somehow we got away from it, but I'm happy that now we're at a point where we are now back celebrating and, and we are now becoming more interested in our heritage and in our history and teaching that and passing that information on to our kids. Yeah, that's great. So I think Congress recently recognized it, was it the 1980s, 1990s? I believe it was the 80s. Okay, mm -hmm. and then um, you did something amazing in 2016. Can you yes. tell us about HB 338? Sure, in um, 2016, um, I was approached by Betty Sawyer for, um, from Project um, and she, who has been like this driving force in the state of Utah to make sure that this holiday is recognized and that this celebration is recognized, um, she approached me about doing a bill to officially recognize it in the state of Utah. And so I was able to run that bill, and I believe it passed unanimously um, in so. both the House and the Senate. And so I'm pretty proud of my colleagues for that. Um, and so um, now Utah is recognized as um, the 45th, I believe, state um, to recognize Juneteenth as an official holiday um, and is celebrated on the week, the, usually the week leading up to, um, to um, June the 19th. And so that 
that Saturday before Father's Day is when we have our big celebration. So that's this Saturday. That's this Saturday. All right, all right. <laughs> So let's um, let's talk about some Juneteenth celebrations in a minute. But first, I want to talk about um, this great article I found on um, the Standard Examiner after this had passed. And you had this quote that I would like to read, and it said, "The celebration allows us to reflect on our successes in fighting for equality." It rem- us of the work that still needs to be done here in Utah we regularly fight modern day forms of slavery including human trafficking and issues of equality in the private and public sectors these are not fights we plan on giving up soon just like we never gave up fighting for freedom from slavery until every last person was free so how um, how do we how does how do Utahns how do people in the United States celebrate Juneteenth today and how how does it Um, How do we keep fighting for these issues? And what are those issues? Sure. Um, In the state of Utah, um, we have to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. We have to keep fighting for justice and and, and justice for everyone. And Juneteenth do remind us, um, it, it reminds us to number one, reflect on our past. We look at our past, we look at lessons learned, um, and then look at where we are, and we have a celebration of where we are, but we also remember we, as a people in this state, in this state alone, we still have a, a, a long way to go. And so I think Juneteenth is not just a festival, a celebration, but there's so much more around it. It allows us to have conversation and to have those difficult conversations about race and culture and our past. Um, and so this kind of opens that door for everyone to, to come in and, and be able to celebrate. That's excellent. So you, <clears throat> this past year, you introduced um, House, Resolu- House Resolution 1, urging restorative justice in Utah's education system, and that passed the House. So what is, what does restorative justice, can you explain to us what it is, first of all, and then what it looks like in practice? Because I believe in the bill, it specifically talked about primary Um, in this state and so uh, one of the things I wanted to look at was how we discipline our kids in the school system and what restorative justice does it it holds um, it restores to the person who was wrong um, where it restores to them it allows the person who did the wrong um, to be held accountable and to make it right and so what it does if the person if the two people are willing to participate um, are the people who were affected by what this person did wrong, they bring them together and they come to a solution on what needs to be done to restore that person. Um, as I said, the person who was who was victimized or who was wronged has to be willing to participate in this, but when it happens, some amazing things happen. Our kids are held accountable. They realize what they did wrong um, and, and work towards making it right. It makes them think. You know, it is so much easier to, to just suspend a child or send someone home and then they have to come back to school and get uh, caught up. For example, I had a young lady who approached me who was a high school student and who um, was suspended for school for something she did. And when she came back, she said, number one, I, don't, I still don't know why I was suspended. Mm. And number two, now I have to get caught up on everything. So she, while she was at home, everything proceeded. And of course, in school, and now she was spending time trying to get caught back up on everything. So. Yeah. I and mean, you know what I really like about reading through the resolution was that it starts with, um, I mean, compassion for where the people are coming from. Absolutely. You know, um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of language in there about recognizing, um, especially I remember specifically children from homes of the, um, that are impacted by divorce, mm-hmm. um, or, you know, other such, um, situations. And so does this look like when a kid acts out mm-hmm. restorative justice in practice looks like, um, 
the student sitting down with the school? Is it the school who is considered to be wronged? Or is it like uh, another student that they have wronged? And then is it like a conflict resolution type of a scenario rather than immediate expulsion or suspension? Yes, it is. Uh, first, I want to talk about the trauma piece of it and how we need to start focusing more on trauma. Mm. Um, because when a kid is, is is acting up in school and misbehaving in school, it's it's always a reason behind it. Mm. And I know there are some people who say, well, it is not our job at, at the school, in the school system, to address this. Um, but it's happening in the school. And so we have to address it. And so, but it, it all depends on what was done. And um, um um, it, it all depends on who, what was done on who the person is addressing. So it may be the school. Maybe the, the, the child went and wrote graffiti on the wall in the bathroom. So, yeah, at that point it is the school, and so th that's who they're working with. Maybe it's another child or another person within the school system. Um, um, or maybe it's a teacher. So it all depends on, on who it is. It, it could be anyone. Great. <clears throat> now, is there... Is there a fiscal impact of this actually being implemented? What is, um, I don't know, be, I know we're struggling right now with school funding. What does that look like in practice for the teachers and the administration and stuff like that? Ab absolutely, it's going to have an impact and it's something that I, I'm looking at. Um, it's, it's, it's a shift in how we do things mm -hmm. and it's a shift in um, our culture and our, and our mindset. And so absolutely, there's going to be some training needed. Um, fortunately, we do have schools right now that is practicing this, and we do have the, this um, resolution was supported by the Utah State School Board. Um, uh, well, you know what, let me back that up. There were some members in the Utah State School Board that supported this. They didn't come out officially and mm -hmm. say that they were going to support this, right. but there were some members in the school board that, that say that they absolutely um, supported this. Um, there are some members in the um, Salt Lake City School District that say that they're supporting this um, one of the things I want to all I want to look at is 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 our rural districts and how this is going to how this would impact them mm. because I think so too often when we have these conversations about what's going on in the, the city or Salt Lake City School District we don't have that conversation about rural Utah and how this may impact them right yeah Lauren did you want to say something yeah if I could make a comment I'm I'm thinking as you bring up like the fiscal impact of what this would mean to schools, I'm also thinking about, well, what would the fiscal impact be to families? Because if somebody is suspended, an out-of-school suspension, then that puts pressure on parents who they have jobs. Mm -hmm. There might not be, you know, they might not be in a position to stay home and take care of this kid mm -hmm. all day, you know, when they're used to them being in school, so... Yes, and, and it does, and it, and it has an impact on families, um, on the families uh, with the kids being out of school. But, you know, I, I'm really concerned about the, edu the quality of education that our kids are receiving and, and the impact that it has on them with missing school and missing their schoolwork. Now, are there times when kids should be suspended? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's not a tool that I think should be taken totally out of the hand. Um, but I think that we need to look at this as one of the options. That's great. Um, I'm curious, and, and maybe we don't have information on this yet, but we've actually been working with Campaign for Smart Justice, which is a program of ACLU, um, to do um, work with, they're, they're focusing a lot on the impact of prosecutors, and also one of the things that they're talking about is the school to prison pipeline. And I'm curious if, um, and maybe they haven't yet, any county, any prosecutors have had any comment on this or have they said anything about this you know what I have not heard anything official I have um, um, from them I have had a conversation with defense attorneys mm -hmm. who are concerned about our kids in the school to prison um, pipeline and and there has been some offline conversation about um, some of the things that we can be doing better um, as a state um, for our kids but I have not had anything official mm, okay from them. that's really interesting and especially as you know I mean, with this whole Olympia Hills thing going on, everybody's, of course, talking about the growth that we're undergoing, and I'm sure as we continue to put more and more kids in our schools, it's going to become more and more intense. Um, so it's really great that you are taking this on. It's so important. And as a mother of two small children who will soon, well, in a number of years, be in the, the school system, it's, mm -hmm. it's great to hear that this approach is being taken. Um, so back to the Juneteenth Festival, is it a month-long thing? Is it just a one-day thing? And do you have any details on what people can do um, to participate? 
Sure. It's an um, event that runs an um, entire week. Um, I think the, the event started like on June the 5th, and they're going to run through next week. Mm -hmm. um, if you want more information, you can go to Project Success website, and they have the entire itinerary that is um, of what the celebrations that is going on because like I said it's not just the festival they're having a black town hall meeting that's going to be going on mm. um, they're going to be talking about having conversation around sickle cell which impacts the black community more than any other community and so there are several celebrations that are going on and conversations that are going on um, how you can participate I said everyone has at least two neighbors grab your neighbors and come out to and participate mm -hmm. that's excellent and so it sounds like it's both celebratory and informational and Absolutely. educational and just a celebration of community i would think it seems it, it great. is it is and the festivals are great it's a celebration of arts and dance and music mm. um i will have a boot out there so please come by and say hello to me great um, and so it's just it's just a community coming together as one big family in in celebration perfect um and then i have one final question for you um in Utah, the major a lot of Utah are white. And so my question is, how can we as white Utahns support Juneteenth, and what is an appropriate way for us to engage? You know, I um, just, I think just coming out and being there, um, and I always say, if you don't know, ask questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just ask the question, because sometimes, you know, you somebody else in the room may have the, the, the same question. I know I I've had people who have approached me about different I, need, I have a question. Mm -hmm. And so I think just coming out and, and being a part of the, the celebration and participating in what's going on and not being afraid to have those hard conversations mm -hmm. <laughs> and being willing, you know, one of the things I always say, I always look at my bias first before I look at someone else's because we all have biases, mm -hmm. all of us. And I always try to look at mine first before I try to look at someone else and try to understand what's going on. Excellent. Amazing. All right. So if you, oh, sorry, Lauren. Oh, do you want to give us more details on what's going on this Saturday in terms of location and what time? And sure, sure. So it's going to be this Saturday, June the 16th um, from 12 to 8 at Ogden Union Station. Um, and so um, come on out. Um, the celebration is free, um, but there are lots of food and, and just bring the family. It's a family event. So bring the entire family out for the celebration. I mean, if there's food, I'll be there. So <laughs> <laughs> that's all you needed to say. <laughs> all right. Great. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you all for having me. And uh, remember, if you want more information, check out Project Coalition. Pro uh, what was Project it? Project Success, Success Coalition, um, and you can check us out, betterutah.org. Check us out on the Facebook and the Twitters and the Instagram, and we will see you next week, 1230. Thanks, guys. Thank